So when we're facilitating a group, uh, we have to consider the individuals, but we also have to think about group dynamics. And that's the hardest part because I'm the kind of person that likes to talk to people one-on-one -on -one and get um, like as much information or, or to listen to someone for a long time. But how do you keep the group going when you have multiple people who want to express their emotions? The important thing is to consider that we're trying to empower people. We're not, we're trying to build them up and give them strength. So we have to be uh, aware of how we come across and how we deal with their emotions because it's almost like a sacred thing where people open up. And to me, it means a lot that people feel uh, comfortable or able to share. So there's uh, two words that I that I mentioned in the, the title of this talk, and it's uh, compassion and empathy. And, you know, most of us... Most of us think we know what these words mean, but uh, just a quick definition. Compassion is concern for the suffering or misfortune of others. And empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of others. Uh, I've heard better definitions of empathy that it's not uh, putting yourself in someone else's shoes, but it's trying to imagine yourself being that person wearing those shoes. Because if you just, um, a lot of people, they try to, fix other people's problems and say, well, if I was you, I would do this. But you're not them, and you don't have the same life experiences. So um, that's uh, important to, to keep in mind that uh, we say that one of the rules is not to give people advice, but it's easy to, while trying to redirect people when they're going on and on, or they don't have the ability to um, to contain their emotions, to, to say, okay, well, uh, let me give you a different way to deal with this. And uh, But when someone is sharing their grief, they're also uh, doing something that we call in, um, in social work and in chaplaincy, they call it meaning making. So it's the process by which people interpret situations, events, objects, and discourses in light of their previous knowledge and experience. So part of the grief care is helping people find meaning in uh, the, their experience. So even a horrible experience such as losing a child or, or a spouse, uh, you can find some meaning, you know, and, and a lot of people say, well, there was a purpose for that. And not everybody can find a purpose, but you can find a meaning. You can make something good come out of the, the terrible instance. And, and that's what we want to help. We want to help people uh, find things that give them comfort, things that, um, something about the person they lost that becomes um, ongoing and powerful in their lives and that it that it gives them the strength to, to carry on. Um, so we're dealing with a lot of uh, very difficult things such as people's convictions, like their beliefs and their, their views about the world and, and even the afterlife. We're dealing with... Um, their personal experiences, which can be good and bad, depending on what happened. And we're helping them process and reflect their feelings. And that's where empathy comes uh, in, in place, because if you just have sympathy, where you're just kind of like, oh, I'm so sorry you're going through this, it's not a heartfelt understanding of, of their experience. And as we share and as we support people, we're they're also seeking comfort. And sometimes people haven't found comfort in anybody else. So we have a huge responsibility to, to be a source of comfort. And so the thing that, that is almost my, my catchphrase now is that all people, even the, uh, the ones that are not experiencing grief, um, they want to be, they want to feel heard. They want to be, um, understood and they want to feel loved. So the empathic aspect of what we're doing is, is, hearing people out, having active listening where we're, you know, very uh, intently listening to what they're saying. And, not, and the thing that I want to talk about is not being triggered by their struggles. So I was going to make a, a bad joke. And it's like, if, if you can't handle someone being angry at the president or at God, then maybe this is the wrong field to, to be helping people out. Because all kinds of raw emotions are, are coming at you when, when you're grieving. And if we truly want to make uh, our groups a comfortable place for people to share their emotions, we have to be able to handle someone saying, you know, 
God really pulled a, a fast one on me or, you know, the military disappointed me so much or something like that and not take it personal and not take it as our chance to defend anybody because it's, it's an expression of pain. And in chaplain school, they always told us to listen to the emotions behind the words. So we've all dealt with grumpy uh, parents that when they're hurting, they insult us and throw things at us and things like that. But it doesn't mean they don't love us. That doesn't mean that they, they hate us. It's just they're so overwhelmed. Uh, it manifests in that way. And the same could be for someone in the group that is just thinks we're all idiots and they want nothing to do with us because that's the only way they can express their pain. And um, so when when you do therapy and stuff like that, you realize that a lot of times anger is an expression of the of depression that people say and, and act up when they're sad inside and they feel that nobody cares for them. Um, and understanding people is the validation that, you know, even if we don't under, like truly understand what happened or the experience they had, that we validate it as, as real. Uh, you know, in, in sexual assault and domestic violence, uh, the first thing they train you is to believe people. If you start questioning them and interrogating them and trying to see if, if what happened really happened, stuff like that, you're not really helping anybody. Um, validating someone is accepting their truth and supporting them through it because it's not our job to, to find answers. Our job is to be there for the person who's, who's struggling. And then the unconditional acceptance, uh, to me, that's the, the greatest definition of love, that for people to feel love you have to accept them. You have to, um, whatever they're going through, whatever background, whatever perspective, you have to truly um, be willing to find worth in them and, and see them as unique and special. And that's, for me, where spirituality would come in. And, and we're going to talk about that as well. But um, so when we provide empathic support, validation, and unconditional acceptance, then we have a healthy environment for them to share their emotions. because. We all know families where they have a very unhealthy environment, wherever they're at, either in their church, in their job, in their family. And like uh, someone said, you know, we are their new family. We are the people who are walking with them and sharing their burdens. So we have to be conscious of always providing that space and that ability. And, and like, you know, like my example about when we have parents who are acting up or children who are, who are acting up, the love is still there and we find a way to to reach out and, and care for them so they uh, they can heal and they can get to a better place. So I have another question for you guys. Um, what do we do as facilitators when someone is in spiritual or emotional distress? What do we do as facilitators when someone in the group is in spiritual or emotional distress? Mm. Let's say that I'm one of the, the members or participants and I'm just like, I'm so confused. I don't understand uh, why would something so horrible happen to me? My loved one was the nicest, most loving person and there's all these horrible people in the world and they're here and they're partying and having a good time and, and my loved one was taken <coughs> from me and... It's the most awful thing in the world, and I don't think I can survive it. Anybody else? Uh, what What do we do when someone is, is struggling? So again, this this is um, what we do. We we support people who are in crisis. So we have to be prepared to um, to brainstorm and to try to figure out how to assist them. Because they they're in a, a critical time and they we might be the only people that you ever reached out to. So uh, having those resources available, having um, our mentors and and supervisors to talk to to follow up and to actually do whatever they they never receive anywhere else. But uh, that leads to the next question. You know, so what what do we do when someone's disappointed with the military? Uh, even the military culture or the whole country and, and everybody related to their loved one's experience. Um, do we, um, what do we do when, when someone, uh, and, and I'll give you an example. Um, we had someone 
come to our um, group in person and say, um, my my son was a baby when he joined the military and he had to do all these stress tests and all these, like they do like, um, like torture um, scenarios where if you get caught by, by the enemy, you have to, uh, you know, not give them any information. And the the sergeant was very rough with him. So when he would come home, he would be almost like traumatized. And she said, you know, he went in a certain way and came out completely different. I blame them for that. And I blame for him taking his life. Um, how, what does that trigger in individuals who are still in the military or who are very... Um, you know, supportive of, of whatever efforts the military is doing. If you have your own personal views about that and, and like, does that even matter? Do you bring that up? Do you try to defend uh, whatever, um, you know, form of the military that he was in? Um, what should you do when someone brings up stuff that upsets you or that throws you off as, as someone who maybe never experienced something like that, but that's their story? People bring up the the justice issue, like, is that just? Should we change it? Um, look at what how it affected them. So if you tell them there's a manual for everything and there's a military way of doing things, what about if someone says, well, that's a terrible way of doing things. They should do it better. Does that trigger something in you as someone who who gave his life and and served for that long? That's one way to uh, to give them options. So so there is a path to maybe advocate for for people. We all have different ways to process, and if that person in, in in that moment is experiencing anger, to try to redirect them, they it, it might backfire and they feel invalidated or that we're not willing to accept where she's at. Uh, so for us as chaplains, we have many uh, tools in our toolbox, and of course, prayer is one of them. Uh, but we also have to deal with people's emotions, so. Uh, you can take the approach where you give everything to God, like your anger, your fears, your struggles, and have him deliver you from that or give you the ability to overcome all those problems. But uh, And there are some people that uh, have automatic results, and there are other people that it's a long process, and there's other things that help them or give them the ability to overcome the challenge. So we, we make that available, but... When it comes down to spirituality just on itself, uh, is people having uh, a, a, a connection with a source of strength or peace. So I don't agree with the idea that you can't talk about faith in in life or in public settings because then you're taking away a huge um, source of, of the ability to heal. Like there are people that think that that, that stuff doesn't do anything and you're saying, well... If you can't talk about it, then the people that it does mean something to them, the people that do find comfort in it, feel that they that they're not giving all the opportunities to connect with that. So, but if someone brings it up in a in a positive way, and the same thing goes for politics, if if all you want to do is bash different politicians and talk about how messed up is the system, then there's no point in even bringing that up. But if someone says, you know, I heard of a law that would provide support for families of, of people that lost their life in the military. I think that that's perfectly valid, just as someone saying uh, prayer was very helpful to me. And I reconnected with God after my loss, and that's what kept me going. So I think that that's beautiful if people can share their experience, even if it comes from a religious or political perspective, but it's something that, it, that moves the conversation forward. Um, and then... This idea of talking about death, you're always going to uh, deal with spirituality in that subject. I've had people tell me, you you can't uh, counsel people because you're just a chaplain. Your job is just to pray and to uh, do whatever chaplains do, you know, do a blessing or whatever. And it's like, then uh, most people don't want a prayer. Most people don't want a blessing because they either can do it themselves or they can get it from their pastor or their priest. What they want is someone that would listen and they would give them um, the ability to discuss the mystery of death, the mystery surrounding our lives and how everything works itself out. 
So um, I think that as facilitators, we need to be sensitive to all these raw emotions, all these conundrums, and um, people have a lot of um, existential questions. Why does this happen? And and check ourselves that, that we don't impart our views and our perspective, but like Lois was saying, let them come up with their own answers and, and tune into whatever uh, convictions they have. Because it, you can guide people, you can strengthen them and give them hope, but we cannot change and, and try to make them like us. We want to honor people who they are and where they're at. So um, that's that's what I wanted to share is that it can be very stressful and very uh, almost traumatic for ourselves hearing all these stories and even being re-traumatized when we talk about, that's why they say don't talk about the, the gory details. Because we all have um, like a threshold of how much can we take. And the same goes for uh, negativity. So uh, so I wanted to share a few things that, that maybe we should uh, think of. And, and you guys can share more if they come to mind. Things that we shouldn't say to our participants. Um, when, when someone is being very emotional and very overwhelmed, for us to say, well, you have some emotional issues you need to deal with. And I know none, none of you guys would do that, but that might be the first thing that comes to mind. Or you need help. Uh, and it can come across like you're crazy and, and we need to get you quickly to the loony house. Uh, or you're being negative. Uh, when someone's saying something raw and something hard felt and we throw out all that's negative, we're gonna, we want to stay positive. That's the easiest way to shut down the conversation and to feel make someone feel belittle or uh, let's move on like we've had enough of that let's let's go on to the next topic or uh, you appear to be stuck in in anger um would any of us like to, for someone to to talk to us like that to make us feel like um what we're saying is not important so yeah so we just um like i used to you know, lead a service and, and somebody would say, uh, we got to be strong. Uh, and I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, you just lost a child or you, you just had a, a major uh, traumatic event. And I thought that they were being dismissive or they were giving people um, like a command to not cry, to not allow their emotions to be expressed and talk about misunderstanding someone or taking it the wrong way. What I realized with time is that people were saying, do not despair. So it's not about not crying. It's not about not, um, you know, there are things that we cannot handle. But when we despair, when we lose hope, then that's when, um, you know, we don't want people to, to get to that place. So um, as we are seeking strength for others and as we are building them up and giving them strength, uh, we have to find the right words and the right mechanisms to uh, to build them up and to, like um, someone was sharing, um, look outside of of their limited scope because it's almost like tunnel vision. Um, and I bring up all the different things that I've been trained in. I've been tra uh, trained in a, in counseling for people who are are losing hope and. Um, when the tunnel vision comes and the only way out of it is, is not living anymore, um, we want to open up the, the perspective where they start looking at the blessings and the other good things that they have in life. Not to invalidate the horrible experience they're having, but to um, give them something to hold on to and, and to know that there is um, you know, light at the end of the tunnel and there are many people that care. I think a lot of people lose hope when they feel that nobody cares and that they're alone. So when it brings it back to the beginning of the conversation, being there for someone does a huge difference. So us caring enough to start these groups, to be consistent, to be available, uh, can mean the world to someone. Just like when we were struggling, someone took the time to love on us. So I want to thank you guys for everything that you do and for not letting um, this, these challenges define you, but give you the ability to um, be there for others and the, and the strength to help them carry their burdens and, and build up a, 
a, a, a stronger person through these challenges. And um, some of the most um, spiritual or, um, you know, some people say you can have spirituality without faith. And I, I really don't know how that works other than the human spirit are people who have suffered a lot. And they've been able to um, build resilience. Um, so we're all resilient. We're all, you know, warriors in a sense that we've been able to keep fighting. And but when when you know, I've never been in the military, but I understand the idea that when a compatriot uh, falls or is injured, you go and pick them up and take them out of the battlefield. So in a sense, that's what we're doing. We're going back to the battlefield of grief. And we're bringing people out and we're giving them uh, nourishment and, and, and the ability to heal from that bad experience. So um, I'm, I'm honored to, to be part of this team.